Welcome everyone. Um, uh, my name is Brad Meyer. I'm the CEO for Blue Stem Health. We're a federally qualified health center in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, we serve, uh, last year we saw just under 17,000 patients. Um, and so we are um, tasked with serving the uninsured, underserved populations. Um, out of our 17,000 patients, uh, about 45% of them um, are at 200% or below the federal poverty limits. <clears throat> and about 43% of them speak a language other than English as their primary language. So we've been really uh, involved in uh, getting the word out about COVID and, um, you know, as well as influenza. And we try to do that in as many languages as possible. I know the state's got a bunch of stuff that they've been doing. So um, you guys are all experts in your field. So I uh, welcome you. Um, so I'll go uh, I'll start with Bernice, uh, Bernice's bio. Uh, Bernice uh, uh, Afu currently serves as the manager of the Community Health Services Division at Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department. She attended Union College in 1979 and received a Bachelor of Science degree in nursing. That same year, she joined the health department as a public health nurse. In 1991, Bernice received her master of science degree from the College of Human Development and Family from University of Nebraska and a graduate certificate and specialization in gerontology from the University of Nebraska, Omaha. In 1995, Bernice was promoted as the supervisor of the public health clinic. She oversees the medical clinics, the home visitation program and customer service section in the community health services. Josie Rodriguez is the administrator for the Office of Health Disparities and Health Equity and has worked for the state for over 22 years. I can't believe you put that, Josie, that kind of... <laughs> uh, she joined the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services as the administrator of the Office of Health Disparities and Health Equities in 2001. Her responsibilities include administering and directing all aspects of the ethnic minorities, establishments of priorities to advance health equity in Nebraska, and building and enhancing collaborative relationships with stakeholders to achieve health equity for all Nebraskans. Josie holds a Bachelor of Science in Human Services Administration and a Master of Science in Healthcare Administration from Bellevue University, my alma mater, same degree. She has worked with the state of Nebraska for over 20 years, working in various positions, uh, including public health, Medicaid, children and family services, and the office of the attorney general. Tim Timmons is also with us. Tim is uh, the communicable D disease program supervisor at Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department. He attended the University of Nebraska for his Bachelor of Science in Nursing and University of Omaha for his graduate course in public administration. Tim also has said uh, training from the CDC and STD clinic management and their epidemi epidemiology course. Next, we have Dr. Josue Gutierrez. Dr. Gutierrez takes pride in being a leader in the medical field, not only for the Creek community that he serves with his satellite clinic, excuse me, with his clinic saline medical specialties, but for the Lincoln and entire state of Nebraska. Dr. Gutierrez has become one of the leading physicians in handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, being one of the first to know of its impacts in early 2020, as well as a crucial voice in safety precautions with COVID-19, in particular, mask wearing, social distancing, and washing your hands. He is a graduate from the University of Ozarks and graduated from medical school in the University of Arkansas in 2013. He went on to do his residency in Lincoln and uh, fell in love with the area. After Who wouldn't, after all? After graduating residency, he decided to stay in Lincoln and work for Saline's Medical Specialties in Crete, wanting to help out not only in Lincoln, but the surrounding areas as well. Their lovely daughter, Rebecca, is Dr. Pride and Joy and a big inspiration for him to help her and as many people in the community stay healthy so they all have a bright future. In 2020, he was honored to receive the numerous honors, amongst them Nebraska Medical Association's 2020 Young Physicians of the Year. He gained national recognition, honored with Medscape's 2025 
or top 25 rising stars in the medical field a competitive national honor identifying him among the 25 best young doctors in the nation. He recently was awarded an admiralship of the Great Navy of the state of Nebraska. That's a, a wonderful designation and, and a top honor from high ranking officials with the state of Nebraska. He is very excited to share his expertise with you about the importance of COVID-19 vaccine and to help return the people in Nebraska to continue enjoying the good life. Dr. Michael Israel is the Chief Medical Officer for Blue Stem Health and specializes in family medicine at their Thompson Clinic. Dr. Israel received his medical degree from the University of Missouri Kansas City School of Medicine in 2011 and completed a family residency program through the Lincoln Medical Education Partnership, LMEP, in Nebraska in 2014. He is board certified by the American Board of Family Medicine. In 2018, he was named the Nebraska so Medical Association's Young Physician of the Year. As part of the Lincoln community, Dr. Israel believes Blue Stem Health's role in the community will continue to grow as they work to develop an integrated behavioral health model that will have a greater quality impact on those requiring services. With the number of primary care physicians in the U.S. being well below what is needed, Dr. Israel is committed to meeting the challenge of helping make quality health care accessible to everyone. Dr. Israel has been working with Blue Stem Health, among others, to find ways to get high-level medical services to all people. He also serves as the medical director at the Lincoln Plasma Center, serves as medical director for VaxCare, and works at urgent care facilities across Nebraska, and previously the medical director for Lancaster County Community Corrections. Dr. Israel is married and has three children. He also serves on the advisory board of the Lincoln chapter of the American Cancer Society, works with Lincoln Public Schools to promote healthy lifestyles, and gets involved with various organizations when possible. He's very committed to doing his part with the Lincoln community and shows dedication and compassion to all people he has the privilege to serve. So welcome everyone. Um, Jerry, since I didn't get a bio on you, would you like to talk a little bit about yourself? Sure, um, I'll keep it really brief. Um, so I've been with the uh, Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services for 15 and a half years. I started on the long term care program. Uh, I'm sorry, long term care ombudsman program with the state unit on non aging. I then moved to the division of public health where I worked for the STD program as a DIS. I then took over management of the. STD program in uh, 2010, and I worked there until February 2019, where I took on the immunization program here at DHHS. Um, I have an associate's degree in human services from Southeast Community College. I have three bachelor's degrees from um, Nebraska Wesleyan in sociology, anthropology, and social work. Uh, I have master work at Bellevue University for um, clinical counseling, don't practice, because um, I'm here, you know. <laughs> and uh, here at the, in the immunization program, we normally, uh, we handle the Vaccine for Children program. We have over 300 sites across the state of Nebraska that we provide uh, immunizations for children um, at no cost or low cost. Uh, we also have an adult immunization program that's not as large, it's only about 30 locations across the state. Um, we have a perinatal hepatitis B program that we um, look after. And then we uh, recently have taken on the COVID-19 vaccine immunization across the state. Bit. So there, just there's just that bit. lift, which is kind of light. Yeah. So we got that going. So that's me. All right. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I think we'll start off with uh, Dr. Israel and Dr. Gutierrez talking about um, the vaccine, its safety and effectiveness. So, um, Dr. Um, Israel, do you want to start? Sure. I um, feel like we could probably just do a little bit of a back and forth with this, Josue, if you're okay. But I know right now we have two approved vaccines for COVID-19, um, one by Pfizer and one by Moderna. Um, they're both two shot series. Uh, the Pfizer is three weeks apart and the Moderna is four weeks apart. Um, they're both very effective in reducing the um, likelihood of getting severe COVID. 
about 95% overall. Uh, the, they are mRNA vaccines, which is a new kind of vaccine production in the sense that it was able to be manufactured quickly. Um, be, this technology has been around for a while and we've been working with it, but this is the first opportunity that we've had to fully make it functional and distribute it widely. I know there's been a lot of concern about the safety of this medic of these vaccines and how quickly they came out. Um, but I can assure you that they still had to go through all of the normal phases that they uh, would for an FDA approval. The reason they were approved so quickly is multiple things. We had funding for vaccines. We had public interest to get the clinical trials going. And we had something called Operation Warp Speed in that we were able to produce the vaccine simultaneously and get it ready to go. Mm -hmm. As soon as it was approved, it was able to be launched. So the normal process of having to wait to get you know, approval and then manufacturing it um, was able to be done simultaneously. And um, there were a lot of people that wanted to be part of it. And something that really slows down um, vaccine trials and any trials really is money and people. And we were able to get both of these right away. Dr. Gutierrez, how'd I do? Good gracious. Kind of took everything, but yeah, just to rehash the topic a lot faster, just because um, just a lot of people were on these trials, thousands of volunteers and the high incidence rate of the disease really helped us get those trials underway. Uh, one of the things that we need to always say once again and once again is the safety criteria was met. So that's something that has to be uh, said over again. Safety is of utmost importance for this vaccine, and it's there. Uh, we see that 95% effectiveness is, is pretty good. You have sometimes the flu vaccine, sometimes not as effective as the one we have right now. So uh, these are two vaccines that are good. There are other ones that are right now in the pipeline. We have the Johnson & Johnson one, as well as the Oxford AstraZeneca. The Johnson & Johnson one is a nice one because it's a one dose series and we're kind of i think those are still in phase three right now if i if i'm uh, not wrong i think that's the last thing i saw yesterday so in phase three so it hasn't yet been approved but those are still in the pipeline right now if we actually look at the safety of this vaccine some of the side effects are really minimal uh, some people get some side effects but we see oh, yeah. that access rate is not that high as many people are scared of it was, was that my mic? Or not? So most of the common um, side effects of it is pain at the injection site. We also look at the symptoms lasting one to two days after the vaccine. Um, normally, the, some of the side effects are more common after the second dose, and that's just because of the immune response that you're getting from the vaccine itself. Um, we also need to look at that sometimes there's fatigues, muscle aches, fevers. Many people have gotten these symptoms just because of the immune reaction that this is vaccine is creating. So you need to be aware of that. It can't truly cause um, COVID because it's an mRNA vaccine. It's only putting the spike protein, which is like the, the attack beam on that cell. Then the, what the body does then is recognizes that cell and remembers it for the next time around. So it's a, it's a newer, like, uh, Israel said it's a newer process of creating it, but mRNA vaccines have been studied for many years before. And now we're just mass producing them. It's faster to create these than the regular cell lines that we used before for other vaccine types. So that's why we're also getting more vaccine production faster, plus more money available as well. Contraindications to the vaccine sometimes include severe allergic reactions, and uh, normally that has not happened very much. If we actually look at it, we see one to maybe 100,000 reported cases of anaphylaxis so far. But if we look at the, the contact of how many people get COVID and pass away, it's over one over 59. 
So we need to look at the risk to benefit ratio of this thing. The anaphylaxic responses can be handled in those testing sites because every testing site has to have uh, epinephrine and other things like Benadryl, things like that. And we haven't really gotten any response of uh, adverse reaction in quinoline. So if we had an adverse reaction to the first dose, you just need to make sure that your clinician knows about that. And you might have to stay 30 minutes instead of 15 minutes in that vaccination, just to kind of be watching you and seeing um, that you're doing okay. What other uh, things here? Um, there's different types of strains. I think I got that question before. Different types of strains of COVID right now. We have the B117, it's the United Kingdom one. You have the B1351, South Africa, and the newer one, that's the Brazil one, is B. Point. I think uh, they call it a B.1. And uh, right now, the vaccine effectiveness is actually seen okay to be, to be given for the United Kingdom and the South Africa. We're still studying the Brazil type a little bit more to see because that has a different spike protein in it itself. So we need to look at what the effectiveness is. But for the first two strains, we're looking at good effectiveness. Something else that people tend to question is this mRNA vaccine. A lot of questions we get is, okay, so that's going to change our DNA. It, it does not. It doesn't enter the, the nucleus or the, you know, the brain of the cell. And so you don't have to worry about it changing your DNA in any way. Um, other um, misinformation that's out there is that it will cause sterility and that it will um, change pigmentation. And all of, and that it will cause you to have 5G in your body. All of these are, are false. So I know that it, there's a lot of stuff out there, and there will be a lot more stuff I'm sure coming out later. You you have to really look into it and see, is any of this stuff real? We get a lot of misinformation out there, especially now that, you know, anybody can put up a blog and say that they are an investigator and know you have to actually look at the, the data, the science, the research and use that. Yeah, thanks for that doctors. Um, I know Bernice, you're actually down in the clinics um, doing the COVID vaccinations for the public. What kind of questions are you hearing and what what's the biggest misnomer or the biggest confusion that you're hearing down there? Well, uh, Brad, one of the uh, one of the uh, questions that come up often is when can I get it? Seems like um, everybody in Lincoln wants to get it, which is a great thing, right? <laughs> and so, what we have done in the past um, month or more is um, really the prioritization that we have from CDC and decisions made in our own state as far as who can get the vaccine. And so for the past month or so, we've been doing uh, older adults. Now we are in phase 1B uh, for our vaccination. And so uh, we started uh, early uh, February, where we started to do uh, older adults and um, essential workers. Uh, so that's where we are right now. So, like I said, most people want to know where they fit in to this whole uh, scheme, and uh, and they've been really very patient. Uh, as they wait, and our job is to educate them about uh, who is next, so to speak, what phase we're in. And uh, people are registering. Uh, we have a, a system out there for people to register for the vaccine. And as soon as it's their turn, according to our prioritization, uh, they are being called and they are being uh, scheduled to come in to get their vaccines. Very good. Thanks, Bernice. And for those of you um, attending, if you have a question, go ahead and put it in uh, the chat session 
um, in the chat log, and we'll get to those um, periodically as I as I look through them. Either me or Jeff um, will get to those. Uh, Jerry, with the vaccination clinics happening, what's the what's the dosage looking like coming into the state, and what's it look like in the past and are you expecting an influx of vaccine coming into the clinic over the next couple of weeks, couple of months with uh, Johnson and Johnson? Sure. Um, so, you know, in the past, you know, we've we've seen it uh, slowly start to increase. Uh, in the beginning, the Pfizer was mostly going towards long term care pharmacy program. So really all we had to rely on here in the state of Nebraska was the Moderna product. We ha that was actually, you know, 4 weeks of having to rely on solely that Moderna product, which is around 11,000 a week. And when you've got over 90,000 healthcare providers across the state of Nebraska, it really didn't go very far. Um, but it took time and perseverance and the local health departments and the partners that they've um, brought on board have really been um, strong, really strong. Um, now we're seeing the numbers start to to increase. I'd say for the last three weeks, we've seen a pretty pretty steady increase of our doses. I know for for this week, the Pfizer, we're looking at about 22,000. For the Moderna, we're looking at about 18,000. And we just got word this morning that Johnson and Johnson will go um, to apply for that EUA tomorrow. Um, ACIP, the advisory committee on immunization practices will be meeting emergency on Sunday. And um, we could be seeing the ability to order sometime next week with ACIP approval. Um, projections for for um, the the John, the Janssen um, product, which is also known as Johnson and Johnson, um, we're looking at about fifteen five. We also know that the the amount of the Johnson and Johnson product is a lot less than what we saw with the um, Pfizer and the Moderna, so. We have no eyes yet on what that's going to look like in the coming future. The CDC really has not shared a good deal with us to really keep us um, abreast on any progress other than what's expected in the next couple of days and what we could see maybe in the next week. Okay, very good. We do have a hand raised. Um, Ellis Wiltsey. Ellis Wiltsey, can you? Uh, um ask your question and uh, who hi guys um i'm ellis i am with 1011 i just i have a series of questions if that's okay and anybody who can answer them or step up to the plate that would be great just to start can you guys talk me through a little bit about what dhhs's maybe approach to the minority community when it comes to vaccinations beyond this are you doing literature are you taking questions are there certain ways you're addressing maybe the skepticism um beyond this sort of um juncture josie i think that's right in your part yeah i was just gonna say i can answer the question <laughs> well first i want to say thank you um brad for uh, facilitating the session and for jeff uh, for organizing it with you and uh, unfortunately um was beyond but she couldn't so I'm sharing uh, this information on her behalf. Um, I will say that we have various inf information in various languages on our website. Uh, so um, if you go to um, dhhs.ne.gov and go to the vaccine page or COVID page, you can find that information. Uh, it's in English and then it's in other languages. So recently uh, put the uh, vaccinate.nebraska.gov page in Spanish as well. And um, that site was available, I think in mid-February. So people are starting to sign in, in Spanish at least. And other languages, people that speak other languages can actually call um, the COVID hotline and also get assistance with signing up. I know that health departments are able to assist uh, well. And if people want to get registered, they can call a local number, which is 531-249-1873. 
or toll free is 1-833-998-2275. And there are and then the language line is available as well, but we do have individuals that speak other languages too on that line. And again, the website is vaccinate.ne.gov. If people are interested in toggle on the top right hand kind of side of the page and hit um, Spanish. So um, we have that available. We're also doing these town hall information out and we are looking at doing those in other languages as well. And then our office uh, really works communities and local advocates to get the information out as much as we can. We are working on a campaign right now with DHHS too to get information out in other languages. And so we're doing a variety of different efforts to make sure that in individuals have information and education about COVID and the, and the vaccine in other languages. On our website as well, um, on that COVID landing page, we have frequently asked questions and those are in a variety of different languages as well. Now we know that not everybody um, you know, may be able to read those languages. So we are trying to put information in uh, on the radio also. So um, a lot of also spreading the, uh, the word by just communicating a lot of the information to advocates out there in the community and they're assisting us. I mean, such as Blue STEM and the health departments and so many other community-based organizations here in Lincoln, such as El Centro Asian Center, um, Malone, uh, so everybody is assisting. I think that it's taking all of us to um, do that too. Yeah, and I also wanted to share that on the provider end. You know, we work a, with a diverse group of, of providers. We work with community-based agencies, local um, health departments, and um, FQHCs. We also, from the program perspective, we also share a lot of different trainings from all over, from the CDC to from immunization um, program management all kinds of uh, diverse perspectives, toolkits, um, training so that we are constantly on a continu continuum of growth, striving for um, equity, equ equitable distribution and access. So we're always trying to, whatever we can find, whatever piece we feel might be of interest of anyone, we, we send out and share with all of our providers. I would also add that, you know, these uh, town halls give us an opportunity to really listen and get questions from the community and whatever we can do to improve what we're doing. We try to do that in coordination with FQHCs, the health department as, and other partners out there. From the health department's uh, perspective, uh, we have been working with the cultural centers. They are our partners and we've been doing this throughout the pandemic. Um, to provide guidance. Uh, we too have um, staff who provide uh, language interpretation. Uh, we have several languages that we use internally. And if there is a need, uh, if someone calls and we do not have that language, we do make that available uh, through uh, contract with uh, uh, a company here in, in Lincoln. Uh, we are, we continue to work with the cultural centers uh, to partner with them, uh, providing uh, vaccine related information, helping uh, them, helping uh, their constituents to register. So registration assistance, uh, they are, we're working with them to identify uh, different sites for vac vaccination clinics. Um, so that we can best serve that community. Um, and they provide, once again, they also provide uh, uh, interpretation services for the, in, the individuals that they work with in the community. Did that answer your question, Alice? And that, that question, I should say? Yes. Um, my just second one would be COVID-19 affects 
minorities, a lot of research has shown at a higher level. If you had maybe a message to people that were skeptical about the vaccine, why it's so important that minorities in particular are seeking the vaccine and the importance of just getting both of those doses moving forward, or maybe uh, someone addressed a little bit earlier some of the common misconceptions or maybe rumors, um, if we could encompass, that's a long question, I'm sorry, but just the importance of getting it and why it's so important that we're focusing on minorities who are um, affected at this higher rate be seeking out the vaccine? Well, I think you kind of answered the, that question. I mean, it's affecting minorities disproportionately, you know, and so the vaccine is a way to, you know, equalize that and reduce that um, risk and, you know, decrease the chance of hospitalization and death. And so we definitely need to uh, be promoting that all across and any questions or skepticism or people that have these, you know, um, questions should come to one of the town halls that we are doing or ask their, you know, primary care provider or, you know, any of the uh, health uh, seek out um, information at the uh, website, the health department's website and look at those questions and then, you know, we're all happy to answer any of them. For sure. I would also add that, you know, many of our minority populations work in at risk positions, you know, meat packing and other positions where they do um, are at a higher uh, risk of getting COVID and unfortunately passing on to their family if they live with multi generations within their family. So that's that's important. I think that stressing the importance of family and keeping family safe would be one of the big reasons to get the vaccine as well. I can a third that <clears throat> I work in a high you know, high risk population as well. And I think that it's just a lot of barriers, uh, cultural barriers. Um, at times, vaccines are not as important or not, not, not as important, but are seen as not uh, as important in some cultures. And I think we need to demonstrate how important it is at this time. And uh, by having community leaders also speak out and uh, really share this information, this important information, that is what we truly need right now. We also need to look at, uh, at some of the individuals that are posting out there and just this misinformation, we need to stop it and nip it at the bud because that sometimes can be detrimental, not to their families, but everyone else. I think that we need to be looking at that and be able to be brave enough to say, you know what, that's not true. You have to be, we need to be able to, to have that um, firm footing and look at science and say, science tells us this, let's go ahead and follow science instead of rumors. Yeah, I, I think it's it's critical that, that we get leaders in those communities to, to step forward because those are the people they trust. The information comes from them. It's more likely to be accepted as, as fact. Do you have another question, Ellis? Just one more, um, which Dr. Gutierrez, sorry if I said that wrong, I don't have the list, addressed it a little bit. Could anybody talk me through maybe the sort of cultural stigmas that may become in vaccines that aren't as important in some cultures, or maybe where a hesitancy comes from a minority community surrounding maybe vaccines in general? Um, if anyone would care to maybe explain that or interpret my question in a better light, if that makes sense. So at times, and, and I can talk to, to my cultural background, as my population believes, oh, if you get a vaccine, you're going to get the disease. And I think that that's a common misconception that you can have in, in these populations. And you have to educate them that you know, the mRNA vaccine will not cause you to have a live vaccine. So it won't cause the disease process. Some of the side effects you have might be the immune response to the vaccine. That is not the actual disease process itself. So some of those common misconceptions can be easily answered. And if they have community leaders taking pictures and posting them on Facebook, I got my vaccine. Those, that's one of the few things you can do to truly uh, promote that trust in, in this vaccine. 
I think the, those little things that we can do can really help uh, the population in general. I, I will also just throw in there that, you know, there have been um, things that have happened, of course, in history with Native Americans and African Americans that caused the hesitancy. And unfortunately, many people have been brought up learning that. And so there's that hesitancy around that is, is the trust factor of government, uh, be it federal or, or state sometimes. And so I think that that goes back to um, as well facts out there and, and the message about it and, and how safe it is and the importance of getting the vaccine. All right, anything else, Ellis? But thank you guys so much for those answers. I am turning today for six and 10. We're trying to reach as many people out there. We're trying to get herd immunity up. I would like to be anywhere by this summer. So just get the information <laughs> out there. Thank you for all your yeah. help. Yes, and we did put some information in the chat for the state registration site, and um, I know that Lincoln has one as well. So um, I don't know if Lincoln Lancaster staff would like to put that on there, but we put the phone for the registration line in about COVID. They can call that line and get those questions answered or get help in registering. Uh, thanks so much. I will stay on here if there are any other. I will stop hogging the questions. <laughs> Thanks, Alice. Uh, there is a question posed. My husband and I are both over 65 years old and have registered for the vaccine through LLCHD and Cole's Pharmacy in Lincoln. Is it possible for us to get vaccinated at our doctor's office, Blue Stem Health, or do we need to wait until we receive notice from LLCHD or the state that they're ready to vaccinate us? I can probably answer this one. Um, uh, so we are working with uh, the Lincoln Lancaster County Health Department on um, whenever there's vaccine available, we've uh, had our own vaccination clinics. Um, federally qualified health centers um, will be getting um, doses from, directly from the federal government in the next three weeks. Blue Stem Health should have um, some. We will be notifying our patients uh, via our Facebook page. So if you're not registered on our Facebook page, um, like and subscribe, as well as through our uh, electronic medical record. So we will have certain criteria that the feds will say, uh, this is the population we want you to serve with this dose. Um, so Dr. Israel and our COVID team will then figure out what's the best way to um, get that vaccine to our patients. Most likely we'll do a special clinic for that population, um, but we will let our patients know um, if they have told us their email address and their cell phone number, um, when they've registered as a patient, uh, they will get a notification via text and email, um, as well as through our Facebook page. So that's how we plan on letting our patients know because we can actually specify a certain demographic um, to only get hit with those mass um, texts. So, Doctor, do you have anything that you want to add to that? No, once we um, once we get the vaccine, then we can kind of make determinations, but kind of like what the health department's going through. It's trying to figure out how many they're getting and how they can best serve it to the most people in the most efficient time frame. So uh, once we see what the actual numbers are, we'll be able to uh, do something as effectively as possible. Yeah, I think it doesn't matter. It, no matter what clinic you go to, um, register with the state because you're not going to know if your clinic's going to get vaccine uh, before the state is having their um, vaccine distribution for certain populations. So don't rely on getting your vaccination from your clinic because there may be an opportunity in the community uh, to get the vaccine that the private clinic doesn't have access to at that point. 
So we want everybody to register uh, no matter where you're a patient at. That is a good point to make. This is Bernice. Um, and I believe I mentioned earlier that we are going through our list right now, uh, the agent. And so we've done the 80 and over, we've done the 75 and uh, over, uh, 73 and over to yesterday we did 71 and older. So you can see where we're going with that. So very soon we'll be doing, and I know this question was about uh, over 65. So very soon we'll be doing the 65 years and older. And yes, uh, if you register, your name is there. And once your age group comes up, you'll be ready. I, this is Josie. I'd just like to add that um, if people register for the state, uh, they and and they're not registered with uh, um, like Lincoln Lancaster, those will be merged. So uh, don't worry about you know thinking that you're going to not be on a registration list. And providers will be using the um, state vaccination registration system. I also wanted to say that a little bit of statistics about in Nebraska. Yesterday, I believe about 245,000 people um, have had first dose, doses administered. 60% of those have been female, 2.4, and, and then 3.2 have been um, Hispanic or Latino. And then uh, about almost 53,000, so 52,844 COVID vaccine doses were administered last week in Nebraska. And more than 117,000 Nebraskans have completed the vaccination. And that represents about 7.9% of the population. So um, we are, we are getting people vaccinated. Of course, we want to get more people vaccinated. So, um, whatever we can do to promote uh, people registering and signing up is would be great. Yeah, and those statistics kind of prove a point that we know in healthcare that women drive the healthcare decisions for the family, right? So um, we really rely on um, the women in the community to reach out to their hard-headed um, spouse or significant other to make sure that uh, um, they take the time off to go in and work and um, that the women are really driving, um, you know, the, the children's appointments, the spouse's appointments, uh, that's something we've known in healthcare, but just hearing those statistics, it kind of puts that pin in that again. All right, I don't see any other questions right now. Um, does anybody have anything that uh, you want to discuss that we maybe haven't talked about already? I'll just mention real quick in the chat. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Israel. I'll just mention real quick, you had brought up children and only one of the vaccines is approved for people 16 and over. There are a lot of trials going around around the country, but children won't be getting this vaccine anytime soon. So just so that people are aware and it's extra reason to get your vaccine to protect your children because the less likely that you get it, the less likely that, you know, you can spread it to the people inside your house. So, um, just protect those little ones, you know. And, oh, yeah, and I, even I though, down and see their, oh, sorry, go ahead, Josie. That's okay. I was just going to say, though, even though children aren't eligible, we are, um, having people still sign them up. So sign children up so that when the vaccine does become available, they're already on that list. <clears throat> I'd like to share just, just how effective the vaccine is. We've, we've seen in the last three, three weeks now, a dramatic, a very dramatic decline in terms of cases of COVID in long-term care or assisted facilities. Once we started giving that vaccine and getting those first doses and second doses in, um, it, in the last uh, couple of weeks now, and, and we're seeing very little in terms of cases out of those facilities. So, the, so an example of how effective and dramatically the vaccine can change things. You know, but the key is getting people vaccinated. That's that's how we're going to get out of this. Is vaccination? 
the more people we can get vaccinated and, and, and how fast we do it is depending on how much vaccine. I think we get enough vaccine, we can keep putting it into people's arms, but if we got to wait to get that vaccine. And so, uh, but as the, the, the more and more vaccine is rolling out, I think uh, we're going to move faster through through these different phases. And, and of course, with the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, where you only need one dose, uh, and, and it does require all the special care and treatment as, as the uh, Pfizer uh, just needs refrigeration. And once you, you know, with, with some, with the Moderna, if you take it out of the refrigerator for so long, you have to use it up. You can't, with, with the Johnson & Johnson, as I understand it, that's not the case. So there's an opportunity there to start using it in private practices as well. Um, because it's easy, easy to handle it in, in, a, in a provider office than the Moderna and, and the uh, Pfizer. So that will help as well in terms of getting getting through uh, the population and getting more and more people vaccinated and getting out of this mess. I see, Jerry, you already answered the question, but uh, we had a question. Please clarify the 22,000 and 18,000 for the two vaccines. Are those doses or persons to be fully vaccinated? Um, and you said those are anticipated doses. Yeah, those are anticipated. Those are uh, anticipated primary doses. Um, those numbers, the the twenty two thousand and the eighteen thousand um, for anticipated second doses, we're looking at about fourteen thousand. Um, for the Pfizer and for Moderna, we're looking at about 17,000 of boost doses. And you also answered another question. Do we have enough providers to administer the vaccine? Yeah, we've, we've got quite a few providers. Um, you know, right now in phase 1B, what we're doing is we're working really closely with the health departments and, and the and health districts. And what we're asking is that, um, you know, we break out oh, the week, we take the weekly allocation, we break it out pro rata, and then we let the um, local health departments know what product they're getting and how much they're getting. And um, then they tell us the providers that they want to utilize for that week and what the allocations look like, it, whether they want the allocations to go to the health department and they'll make a transfer or if they want direct ship to those providers. And in the interim, you know, in, in pre preparation for um, Phase two, you know, once we've got plenty of vaccine, we have also been onboarding providers throughout this entire process. So there's the VFC program, which I mentioned earlier. Um, we sent out uh, COVID vaccine agreements to all of those providers too, and just said, we're not saying you're becoming providers today. We're just saying we want to get your paperwork in line. We want to make sure you have proper refrigeration, the ability to storage handle, and if you need to move, can you monitor? Um, vaccine. So we've been doing that all along. So overall, we were looking at about a little over 500 and some providers across the state. However, right now the vaccine is is not supporting those kind of providers. It's, it's a much smaller um, allocation that we're receiving. And so right now we're really pushing it to those locations that the local health departments have identified as high vaccination, uh, high throughput sites. All right, we have one. Uh, what is the level of effectivity or what's the effective level of the first COVID-19 vaccine dosage if one is exposed to a variant of the virus? Well, United Kingdom variant or South Africa, the United Kingdom variant has some uh, mutations to the spike protein. Uh, it's more of a conformational change, but you still get a pretty good effectiveness with the United Kingdom variant with the vaccine, but the South Africa one has a little bit more of um, of reduction in the neutralizing antibody, but it's still effective. Now the Brazil variant, we're still studying a little bit more with the vaccine effectiveness in that one. So the first two variants, it's still effective. The Brazil one is still under study. All right. Um, we have another question, just so I have this right, we should register with the state, even if we are already registered with Lincoln Lancaster, Lincoln Lancaster Health Department. And I 
no, if you've registered for the Lincoln Lancaster Health Department, you don't necessarily have to register with the state, right, Josie? That is correct. They should, they'll be merged either way. So um, if they register for one, they should be merged in. Uh, the health department should be getting that information from the state or vice versa. And one of the things I was thinking of, um, so what's the difference between the effectiveness of a vaccine and immunity? Is, is there much of it? Because we hear those terms flipped around all the time. Is it the same thing? So Tim or Michael, do you want to answer? I think Tim was like moving along. So are you gonna answer? Yeah. <laughs> well, I can answer. Um, so the effectiveness, what we know for sure is that the effectiveness of these vaccines are about 95% effective. And what do we mean? It's effective from preventing severe disease or death from COVID. So does it mean that you're immune? Not necessarily. So that's something we're still getting, you know, information about. So immune means you can't get it. We're not saying that right now. What we're saying is it is possible to get it, but not in a high enough amount that it shows a clinical um, manifestation. What does that mean? That means you won't get the the symptoms from it, right? Or the severe enough symptoms that you're in the that you end up in the hospital or dead. And at the end of the day, that's the what's important. Can we prevent you from dying from this awful, awful thing? And so that's the difference between effectiveness and immunity. It, we're effective at preventing hospitalization and death. Um, we're still studying to see if you can, if it will, or what the immune response fully is. Yeah, and, that, and that's the reason why, even if you've been vaccinated, you still need to wear a mask social distance to all those things to prevent because the the trials of the vaccine studied just what you're saying is is how if it can prevent you from getting the illness becoming sick and de developing severe illness it didn't look at whether you could transmit it still if you got infected even though you didn't get ill or seriously ill can you still transmit it there's some recent studies that seem to indicate it does prevent transmission, but there needs to be more studies to verify that. But until we we know that for sure, that's the reason, even if you've been vaccinated, fully vaccinated, you still need to take those precautions, mask, distance, um, hand washing, so on. We have about seven minutes left. Are there any other questions or is there anything that uh, the panelists want to discuss maybe double masking. I know that's been in the news a lot lately. The recent studies show that double masking is, appears to be more effective than just a single mask. Um, there's a certain way you have to do it. And I think I would have you go look at, at the CDC uh, videos and information, but double masking appears to be more effective. So if you can do it, go for it. But it's also wearing them correctly, right? It's just correct. two masks on is not. It has to what cover the nose, guys. <laughs> that, yeah, and a lot of people, um, and you see the, uh, in the media you know, interviews, people are wearing a mask and their nose is sticking out. And if we were to follow up with them and say, do you wear a mask all the time? Yes, I do. Well, it's not really effective if your nose is hanging out the top of it. Um, and another thing with masking that we see quite a bit is when people go to talk, they remove the mask to talk, which defeats its purpose. And so it's really important to keep that mask on and understand the, you know, the whole point is to prevent the spread of the particles. And so it's the masking is important. And uh, Josue, I think the CDC stated a surgical mask underneath a cloth mask is the what they want for double masking personally i'd try and get everybody to wear a mask the right way first but you know one step at a time and i, I applaud all the people that are doing it and everybody you know is taking real 
you know, diligence with this, we're making headway. If you look at the numbers, we're making good headway right now. And we have to give credit to not only the vaccine, but people taking this seriously. And I, f I feel like we're doing a good job with that now. Yeah, I think in general, if you look at the number of also blue cases, they've been tremendously low. And I think that masking is also extremely important. That. So you see the viral spread really goes way down with masking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's been an uh, incredible uh, uh, flu season. I, I don't think I've ever seen a flu season like this where we've had in Lancaster County 12 cases of, I think, four or six that were confirmed. The others were on rapids at this point in the flu season. That, that's just heard phenomenal, heard. phenomenal. Uh, I mean, we're, we're at, at this point in time, a year in. From it was around this time that we we really started getting into this COVID, uh, and uh, during that time uh, we learned a heck of a lot. And you look at where we were and where we are now in terms of you know, we started out with having very little access to testing. Now you can get it over the counter and go home and test yourself. Uh, in terms of uh, treating individuals with COVID. Our knowledge level has increased from experience and stuff that uh, survival rates are a lot higher now than they were at the beginning a year ago. Uh, we have medications, we have uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies that can be used to prevent hospitalizations. Uh, and then our, 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 our knowledge about methods that are non-pharmaceutical to prevent spread. And, and we've, we, we now we know in terms of masking distancing and hand wash that they work. We know that when communities implemented those mandatory masking and stuff, cases went down. It works. You know, we learned that over, over this past pandemic from, from when we started. So we, we've come a long way and now we've got a vaccine in incredibly short period of time uh, producing a vaccine that's very effective. Um, so uh, it's been a long year, but we've come a long way. And just to uh, point one thing out, we are testing for the flu, just I, because I know that's one of the things people are saying, oh, we're, we have no flu because we're not testing for it. That's absolutely not true. If you come in with those flu-like symptoms, if, you have a if we have the rapid test available, you will be tested for both COVID and the flu. You, it's not just one or the other. So we are checking for the flu and the low rates are incredible. Yeah. yeah, that was a big concern uh, coming into the flu season where we had a dual pandemic with flu and, and, and how do you sort that out? And there were there were lab tests that were developed that included both influenza A, influenza B and COVID on, on the same lab test to cut down on having to do you know, two separate uh, tests and swab an individual twice and so on. So, yeah, that's another area that uh, we got lucky. All right, we have two more questions that came through in a little amount of time. So uh, we'll go with Rod C first. He's got his hand raised. Rod. Can't hear you, Rod, if you're talking. Uh, looks like he may have just left. Okay. Um, the, all right, the other question that we had coming in from Anthony says, why Nebraska removes people with high risk medical conditions from the vaccine priority list? So why was that removed? Well, and, and I'll answer that, but I'll also you know, I'll give an opportunity to the health department to um, answer it. Um, right now, the state is trying to work its way through ages because age has, has really been seen as, as a factor in um, a lot of the um, deaths that we've had. We've had a lot of deaths between the age of uh, 55 and older, and um, that's that's kind of why, and, and it's kind of easier. I'll give you some statistics on the death. Of the 2,025 deaths that have occurred in um, Nebraska, 
35% have been uh, for those that are 85 and older, 29% have been between 75 and 85, 19 between 65 and 64, and 11 between 55 and 64. So you can see that 94% of the COVID related deaths have been in those that are ages between 55 and 85. So although the focus has been to save lives and that's what people are we're trying to do since we've seen those, that data, really trying to focus on those older populations, but you know, the state is working and the health departments are working to um, also make sure that they get people with those comorbidities in, in when they're um, working on those age categories as well. So really trying to um, vaccinate uh, by age as soon as we can. So as Jerry said and others said, the, as soon as we can get more vaccines, I think we'll be able to get more individuals vaccinated as well. And I do want to um, also take the opportunity but uh, test Nebraska is still available and still free. So if people do want to get tested, and I know they can get tested at um, your facility too there, the Blue Stem, um, Test Nebraska is still available as well. So uh, just a reminder for everyone. All right. Well, thanks everyone. Um, our time is up. I, You guys are the rock stars in Nebraska and our area. So I really thank you guys for all the work that you do. I know it's, you know, you don't get the recognition you deserve and it's tough. It is really tough, but uh, uh, we appreciate all the work you guys do. And uh, I am thankful that you guys were able to take part in today's conversation, so. Thanks, Brad. Can I just get a reminder? I know Tim mentioned it before, but just a reminder to, um, and um, as he said, the basic precautions, uh, be big red responsible, wear a mask, wash your hands, make sure you, stay six feet apart and then stay home if you're sick. So I just wanna end with that. Thank you everyone. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Take care. Bye. Stay safe. Bye.